All right, thanks everyone for coming today. Welcome to Dab Lecture 3. Uh, today we're going to finally get into the hardware portion of Dab. We're getting your kits soon, and you know, actually working with physical structures. So, maybe that is what you want to say, Andrew. All righty. We got our PCB design workshop. Um, that's going to be next Friday at 6.30 p.m. Right after that, we're going to have our ice blocking off of uh, Jan Steps. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, what's the new name for Jan Steps? Congress. Okay. Um, yeah. So these are next Friday. Um, come out, meet some people, break the ice. Uh -huh. Hi, Carl. Okay. All right, so for lab two, I think all of you in here have completed, well, most of you in here have completed, and it's okay. Our checkoff rate is a 66%, so not 69, sadly. But we're getting there. And our goal is really 100, this is just a joke. But anyway, um, a lot of things we learned, hopefully. So I wrote a bunch here. I kind of want to go through these. So one of them is like, when you're doing defined statements, we didn't talk about this in the lecture, that's our bad. But when you do the syntax, you have to use a backtick, which is different from an apostrophe. If you use the apostrophe, it'll give you some random error. It'll say like declaration invalid or something. Um, you don't want that, you have to use the backtick. I think all of you figured it out. So the backtick defined at the top is like a, is like a macro that defines some something that represents something else, like how hash one equals like that weird number. Um, but then later, when you use hash one, you also have to do a backtick and then hash one so that it knows you're using like the, mac the define that you use that you defined before. Um, so I'm hoping all of you read that out. Next, um, radix is a, really, is a really useful thing to use. So in, in model sim waveforms, you might have been like looking through the hash, right? And you're like, how am I supposed to tell what all these zeros and ones mean? How do I compare it to like the actual answer? Well, if you do rate, if you right click on the waveform and go, scroll down to radix, and then I, I think that's how it's pronounced. I have no clue actually. Um, you can change it from binary to unsigned. And when you do that, It'll represent the numbers in just our in yeah in just in unsigned form, so just regular decimal for you guys, and then you can tell what numbers are getting cut through. This is useful for like the Fibonacci too. Um, if you look at it in binary and you start comparing the waves, it's probably pretty hard to do um, respect if you went through that, but it's, it's easier if you just change the radix. Um, so now you know. And finally, or actually I think there's one more in there. Yeah. So initializing our registers. So either in your design. Or uh, if it's an output of your design, you should initialize your first value so that when you're doing like a clocking, like in the clock divider, if you don't initialize your clock divider to a value at the beginning, you're going to be just flipping to not clock, right? But then it's going to look at the value and be like, oh, it's disconnected. What do I flip? So you're just flipping a disconnected. So it's just disconnected to more disconnected. So you have to add a starter as a 0 or 1 so that it can flip to the other value. Um, hopefully, you all got that too because you got checked out. You probably did. Those are just important. These will keep coming back up, so that, um, let's just not make these errors again, and hopefully we learn from that. If anyone else has anything they learned from the lab, it should be a good time to say it now, because then everyone can like remember it, go through it. If anyone wants to volunteer something that we didn't cover, we can also add it to this after the lecture. Doesn't have to be now. Find something you can come up and tell us after the lecture. Okay. So, this is our clock divider. Uh, one of us, me, may have uh, said some things that were not exactly correct um, with your clock divider. So we're going to be providing you guys with a provided module that will take care of your clock divider for you. And Achinti is going to go over the mathematically correct version that won't give you the one off air that I was having. Wait, so no, don't have that yet. Yeah, so, if you look at the code here, um, so some people said they want to go through some code in this lecture just so that we can like talk through syntax if you're a little confused because it, it was a lot of work in this lab and it might have been overwhelming. So I guess like we have a module here, right? This is the clock divider module. You guys all filled out the skeleton, hopefully. So um, you're gonna you have your input input, which is in. This is my code from last year, but um, so the variable names might be different from yours. But in is just your input clock. Out is a register that um, has your output clock, and I initialize it to zero, as we talked about, so it's not disconnected. Then we then have a counter that's also initialized to zero, because that, if that's disconnected, you also have a problem. And then, and I, uh, so in this solution, you actually have, at every positive edge of the input clock, 
you're going to, that's when you're going to be ticking uh, or like counting up, right? And so your counter is going to the total divided by two because you're using a positive, so that's only half the signal. So you have to like divide by two. I think all of you guys have that. Um, and then my counter starts at zero. It like, or, or whenever I'm resetting my counter, I take the outputs. And otherwise, I'm just incrementing the counter. So I think that part of the skeleton hopefully made sense. And I think a lot of you might have started out with solutions similar to this. But can anyone tell me what the two problems with this are? Because you can see in the waveform. So my, the parameter I passed in was a four. Sorry, I didn't show the test bench here, but I passed it. I wanted division by four. But is this currently dividing by four? So input is the top, just the clock signal uh, here. And output is the small clock here. Yeah. No. Yes, not. Eight. So what is this getting divided by right now? Eight. I think it's six. So there's six periods of clock in every period of small clock, right? Oh. I think I could be kind of wrong, but I'm pretty sure. That looks like six. Two, three, four, five. <laughs> Try and count that right now. Well, well, I mean, the, this is one period. So from here right, right. to... Okay. Pretty sure it's six. Okay, so all right. The important part of that is it's not doing it correctly. So can anyone tell me what a problem is? If you check out with me, I'd probably explain this. Right. Uh, is this something to do with the uh, integer division of tick total? Yeah. So can you expand on that? Uh, so then basically, if it's uh, if tick total is a if tick total is like an odd number, then it'll become uh, when the device is going to give like a 0.5 something, and then it'll just uh, get rid of the 0.5. Nice. That is definitely one of the problems. So how would you go about fixing that? That's a good question. It's kind of a cheeky answer. <clears throat> you, could just, you could just add one more, but it doesn't really... Uh, it just doesn't really. It's a little bit weird when you when you have like the odd numbers, because like you you have like a base clock, but then if you're trying to like divide down by like odd numbers, it doesn't really work. All right, that's what we're getting to. So, does anyone want to help with how we can get to the odd number work? Could you get rid of the positive and divide by two? Yeah. Okay. So that's the first thing. So this, if when divided by odds, what's going to happen, right? Let's say it's like three. We're gonna to wanna to flip the clock like here, and then you're gonna flip the negative edge uh, is it? At, the, at this negative edge, because then this is the halfway point between three periods, right? So at one and a half periods of the input clock, you wanna flip um, the output down. I think that's what the camera was saying, um, but we'll get there. Um, but that is, that, is the, that is one fix, so that will actually, Fix this so we can do odd numbers if you also include the negative edges. Because if you only do positives, the whole point of like the divide by two is that a pause edge only occurs half the time. So you can only count half to half the total. But if we count every tick of the input clock, now you can count to the full to tick total. Um, but what could one more problem be here? Because right now, like the division by two isn't actually a problem here because it's an even number, right? So why is it counting to six? Uh, I think you either want to change your counter to reset to one, or in like the counter equals equals, you just do a plus one. Because right now it's basically incrementing three times instead of two times. Wait, plus one or? Or, right? Okay. Or, or what are you doing? Minus, minus one. one. Minus yeah, one. Minus okay. One. Nice. Okay, so that's the other thing. So right now we're counting uh, six positive edges because counter is going to tick total of two. Tick total is four, um, so it's going to count zero, one, two, because four divided by two is two. But when you count from zero to two, it's inclusive, right? So that's three takes. So three positives have to happen before we flip again. And that's why it's going to um, six instead of uh, four. Does that make sense? What I, I said that kind of badly. Do you want to reiterate it? Sure. So our original design right here has a pause edge here, 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 
here, and then flips, right? So that's on three ticks when we want to tick on two pause edges in this situation specifically. So actually, we want it on the neg edge of the second one. Yeah. Right now, it's an even number. OK. So we have, so instead, we're going to be using the neg edge as well as the pause edge. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And it flips right here. Wait, no, no. You're explaining the first part. Shit. I was talking about the, the divisive, like, counter minus one thing. Oh, the counter minus one thing, it doesn't matter on this. It, you just have to think of it as, a, as an integer counter. So if you have an integer counter, right, and it starts at zero, then that zero is inclusive uh, to your count. So you say zero, one, two, and that's three ticks, but you actually wanted only two. And uh, that's what our problem is right now. So if you guys uh, start counting like uh, digital designers, then you always start with zero, and that's one finger, one digit in your in your count. Um, Any questions? Okay, how many people understood that? Right. So the people who didn't understand is is which part is more the subtracting one from counter? Or dividing by two, or I mean, okay. I guess I mean we can move on. You can ask questions later too. I guess, but that's that's what we want to get at. The clock divider may have been. I mean, it's probably confusing because of this. Um, but if you go to the next slide, we have the, like, the solution with the things added in that you guys graciously came up with. Um, so here. I decided to just subtract one from tick total, um, and then the I also didn't divide by two. Instead, I just took out the pause edge and used in. So, can someone tell me what always at in does? Like, what is it? Second, whenever in changes positive or negative. Yes, perfect. So that includes pause edge and negative, and I can do the odd numbers. Um, if you if you put this code in and you run a clock divider with like a, an odd parameter, like we go from fifty megahertz to one kilohertz, right? That's going to be a division of an odd number. It'll only be correct if you make these changes. Right. Okay, anyway, <laughs> from there, that was like the hard stuff. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Talk about the toys. And by toys, I mean like $100 FPGAs. Um, so how do we work with them? How do we not break them? How do we make useful things? Uh, and then and we'll lead you through the spec as always. All right. All right, this is just a timeline. You guys know where we are. Lab three, we're still doing PGAs, and we're almost on fall quarter. Congrats, we're almost at finals. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, this is my section now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're on to FPGA fundamentals. This is where you're going to learn the very basics of how an FPGA works. Uh, so, what are s so we're going to talk about circuits first, right? Uh, circuits are really cool. Like, if you want to learn more about circuits, you can go take RAP or MicroMouse or go to our, one of our workshops, say like the one that's next week on Friday for PCB design. Um, it's really useful for making stuff and uh, it's permanent. But what if you have like a new standard or uh, you, got, you got to make an upgrade to your circuit, right? You have to completely start over and redesign things, right? That's a huge pain. Um, it's also a pain is doing the debugging. So if you make an entire PCB, you spend like three weeks on it, and then you're like, oh shoot, I forgot a power trace, then uh, you can't use your PCB anymore, right? You have to completely restart over, wait for it to get shipped back in, and it takes a really long time to do development. Instead of doing that, you could use FPGA and do some of the same things and make it so that you could just change a line of code and then uh, recompile, and it'll be all set. Um, so this is FPGAs. It stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. Um, it's made out of a bunch of configurable logic blocks. So it's these little guys right here, right? Each uh, logic element, which is in here, in our configurable logic block, is made of a lookup table, a flip-flop, and a mux. So we know what a flip-flop and a mux is because we made them in lab two, right? Does anyone know what a lookup table is? Tobias? 
basically, we can uh, we can uh, basically take an input and get like any like and or combination kind of. Right. So our lookup tables actually contain uh, the information for gates in this sort of configuration. So based off of what inputs are put in, it essentially acts as the gate for here, right? So what would uh, what would you what would the select bit to this mux be when you define a Verilog register? If you consider the flip flop is a register, what would the select bit be to the mux? One. One. So when you define a Verilog register, it's actually flipping this mux to one, and it's storing the state right here, right? And then your wire is actually the zero right here. Um, all righty. Uh, some of the pros of FPGA architecture is that it allows you to prototype really quickly. And again, you can just change a single line of code, and uh, you can put it back on the FPGA, and it works just fine. Um, Okay, so that's proof by fascination of FPGA. It's reconfigurable using the LUTs. The LUTs, you can basically create a new LUT and set what? That's like basically the, the like, cream of the crop or whatever they say. It's like the crux of what helps us make it reconfigurable, right? Is that you can change like the RAM storage of and of the LUT to like give you any different output from any set of inputs. Um, so what can we really do with something that's like high frequency and like you can like prototype really fast, what kind of fields or like, um, I don't know, just use cases do you guys think we'd have? Have you heard of any for FPGAs before? Emulators. Emulators? Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Trading. Yes. How does trading make a lot of money that way? Yep. Encryption. Encryption? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of people doing encryption with FPGAs. Uh, hardware encryption is a big deal. Have you ever heard about the Intel Spectre uh, hacking? Uh, that was a huge deal and dropped Intel stock by a ton. Everyone really, really cares about hardware uh, in cryptography right now. All right, anything else? All right, we came up with some examples anyways. Yeah, I mean, can't list them all, but hopefully here's a few. You guys already covered a lot of these. This, this one, this is what we're doing. We're processing. Um, our input signal and like getting output signal, right? Um, we, got we got hardware acceleration. So emulation, pretty close. Financials, uh, ASIC development. So FPGAs are actually used to make uh, designs for system on a chip. So those little tiny chips, uh, you use FPGAs to design the logic behind that. Image processing. This is also a very uh, new field, or it's a very good field to get into right now. Uh, a lot of research is happening with uh, hardware uh, image processing. Um, then you have communication systems. This uh, also applies to the DSP sort of deal. Um, also, one of those things that everyone wants to do right now. And data centers. All right. Okay. So to work with an FPGA, there's a couple steps. Um, you've probably seen in Fortis, we've only been doing analysis and synthesis. And now we're going to go through the whole, the whole deal. Stages. So let's get into this. Um, we got the overview here. We got synthesis, simulation, round place, timing analysis, and post programming. So we'll go through each one. So starting with synthesis. Synthesis is what we've been doing. Right? We've been clicking analysis, analyze, synthesize, and it creates like arcades for us. That's basically that's basically it. our hardware description language gets uh, synthesized into a group of gates and other circuit elements. Basically. Um, It'll like lay out something like this, and there's ways to actually see what kind of a gate list it's creating. But in this stage, it's really just like uh, it's not really optimizing for you. It's just straight up looking at your hardware description language, seeing like what gates can be made out of, and just making it on first try. Um, so no optimization yet. Literally just creating gates. And the next step, we have simulation. So this is where we test that group of gates to be like, is our design actually working? You guys have been doing this in model sim, you know, recompile. Uh, simulate again. This is what this is really important for us because if you like don't simulate, you go straight into hardware. You have to wait however long. Uh, I think final dab sometimes took some people like three minutes to compile. It's like five minutes for me. Yeah. So unless you have like a speedy computer, uh, 
Um, so you don't want to always be compiling on your FPGA, waiting for it, just wasting time, and then see some error and be like, oh, I could have fixed this in. You know, like you missed like an and instead of an or. So instead of popping an error like that, make sure to simulate. Make sure all your waveforms look good in simulation. Um, this is what MonSyn does for us. Uh, and then we go into place and route. So this is where the algorithms are kind of cool. Um, so you might be thinking like, all right, we got a bunch of AND gates, OR gates. How is FPGA just knowing like, okay, this logic element has to have this LUT with like these inputs and outputs, and then that has to connect over here to another group of like combination of logic LUT. Um, well, if you think about it like that, it's a little magical. You can like read, read research papers and stuff, but there's a lot of algorithms that they use um, to like, I think some of them called like annealing or something, but you, you can read up on it. Uh, we're not going to go into this too deeply, but there are a lot of algorithms out there. I think Quartz has its own for actually taking your net list and putting it onto hardware. So this is where they, this is where it like starts optimizing like which gates go where, how are they going to be connected, um, and just making sure it does the right thing. Uh, and for us, this is all covered by Quartz because. Quartus knows our FPGA. That's why it's very important that you put the right number in. If you don't put the right number in for your FPGA, uh, it's just gonna, like do something wrong. We actually, I don't think we put the not wrong number in, so I don't even know what will happen, but it'll probably not synthesize correctly. Maybe if it's the D10 family, it'll be close, but just Everything get the, yeah, just get the, just get the right number. Um, I don't think it'll blow up, but maybe it's possibly short something, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So a lot of algorithms there, you can read up on if you want. But we won't be using Bogus Sword because that is not an optimizer. Uh, from there, I'm going to generate program files. So you might have been seeing that in the top right of these slides, there's like a little screenshot that says the thing from Cortis. So this kind of puts you through the steps of what Cortis is doing for us. If you click compile, it'll do all these steps. Um, so here it's going to generate program files. So how that FPGA works is you, instead of programming directly on the chip, I think you load like a binary file onto through the USB blaster, um, and it loads those bits into a binary file on the on the, on the development board. Okay. And then the FPGA uses that binary file to actually construct like all the design onto itself. You want to expand more on that? Right. So uh, in the previous slide, when we do our place and route, that builds something called a net list, right? So if you remember back to our diagram of our FPGA, there was a bunch of wires between our uh, our logic blocks. Um, those wires are actually part of the net list that you just flip those wires on or off depending on which stuff you want on and off in your logic block, right? Um, that's not really that effective to like go through each of those wires and explain. Uh, it's not really effective to go through each of those wires and say boop, 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 on, off, on, off, on, off. So instead, we built something called a binary file that then uh, we download onto the FPGA where there's a really small, really dinky, really useless MCU, uh, which is a little tiny computer that will essentially, when everything gets booted up, it'll turn on from that computer and use that as to load it on. Um, and that is called a bit loader. We'll actually get into USB Blaster and uh, JTAG later in the presentation, uh, where you're going to actually learn how exactly we upload things using ports. And then finally, well, not finally, but middle step, timing analysis. So you guys all love clocks now because you're so good at clock dividing, but um, we don't actually have to worry about this too much because like our modules don't run at super high frequencies. But basically, uh, if you remember setup and hold time from the last lecture, timing analysis, if you give it the right parameters, can like tell you if all your setup and hold time restrictions are met, which is really important if you're like running your FPGA program at 50 megahertz because then you can't just like feed in some input and expect that input to immediately get shifted because like uh, it's not actually instantaneous on hardware, the, the electricity has to flow. But um, this can like check if your data path, um, if you've learned data path and controller in like M16, it can check if like the data path is giving you um, your outputs fast enough that the controller can use it, stuff like that. But this, we're not gonna like get too deep into this. Most of the stuff we're saying here is just like you know how that PJ works, you don't need to like really think about it. Timing analysis. <clears throat> Finally, okay, this is the top thing. So you coded the thing, you made your design, um, but now you want to put it on hardware. So I'll give you some screenshots of this later, but uh, once it's on hardware and it doesn't work, 
then you're like, oh, uh, I simulated it, it should have worked fine, what happened? But maybe you left your buzzer on the way. So don't do that. Make sure all your hardware is plugged in properly. The, we'll be going through all the I.O. pins on the FPGA later, but you want to make sure that like you plug them in into the right place um, and, and make sure that the actual I.O. standard is set properly and stuff like that, which we'll get into. But it's still possible to have bugs on hardware, so don't don't think that just because it's most of the Abby software, you don't get to do a little hardware shenanigans too. So that is the post programming. Alrighty. And now we're gonna go on to our own FPGA. This is our Altera Max 10 series. Does anyone remember the exact uh, the exact part number? Oh man. Yeah. Uh, 10M50DAF44DMG. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Perfect. Um, does anyone know how many logic elements uh, our Altera FPGA has? Take a guess. Any guess? 1.2K? A lot more. 50K? Okay, you saw the. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it is 50K. Um, which is quite a lot. Um, your DAV should take anywhere between 16 and 20K, so it's not going to no, be think, too limiting. I think ours were like 7 or 8K. Really? Yeah. And I must really screw something up then. No, not yours was 7K, mine was 8K. Okay, interesting. I don't know what it was. Um, yeah, so this is our dev board. This is the DE10 Lite development board. Um, it's important you read the data sheet. This data sheet is actually linked in the slides and in the spec. It's gonna be very, very important for every lab going forward, right? You're gonna to need to use this for finding your pins. Now, data sheets, please read them, okay? It's 74 pages, it's not that much, but if you really don't want to read the entire data sheet, uh, chapters one and three are the really important ones. Um, that's just to get like a basic understanding. Uh, three is where you're going to actually find all your pin assignments, so you're going to actually read through that front to back anyways uh, at some point because you're going to be using pin assignments. Now, on our FPGA we have two buttons that are already built in with debouncing. So if any of you guys have know about debouncing or built a debounce before, you guys don't have to do that, it's great. <laughs> um, button debouncing, like you guys learned in ops, is where you push a button, but since it's a mechanical switch, it kind of has a bunch of noise introduced that thinks that the button's been pressed on and off, on and off, on and off, over and over again. We don't want that. That could give us some uh, damaging results with our input. So there's something called a Smith trigger debouncer that takes care of that for us that's already done in the FPGA. Then we have our switches. There's actually 10 switches, and on top of those switches, there are 10 LEDs. Now. Look at the data sheet to find out which represents the down position and which represents zero or one. This is a screenshot directly from the FPGA. Can anyone tell us which one's logic zero? Yes, the bottom one. Great job. All right. Now onto our LEDs. There's two status LEDs. So one for like power, and the other one's like uh, like you're programming it, or there's like an air state or something. Uh, then there's 10 programmable ones, which are right above the uh, clip switches. Those are actually going to be used in uh, checkpoint one. So you guys are going to get really familiar with that very soon. Um, yeah. Then comes the seven segment display. This is one of the most uh, powerful things on our FPGA. We could actually use this to display uh, a ton of information. There are six uh, digits six, seven segment display digits, and each digit has eight inputs, right? So when you want to turn something on with a seven segment display, you actually turn on hex zero, hex one, hex two, hex three. So for example, if you wanted to turn on uh, a one on the hex display, then you'd actually have to do, uh, you'd have to have the bit encoding of hex zero one is on and hex zero two is on. So that'd be one and one right here. Right. Um, this is also going to be used in your lab. This is going to be uh, at the very second section. Yes, very second. Checkpoint two. Um, <laughs> now we finally are getting to our clocks. 
Uh, we're going to have three clocks in our system. Two are 50 megahertz, and then one is a 10 megahertz. Uh, we're going to be using our 50 megahertz clock for all of DAV going forward. Um, this is why we needed clock dividers uh, last lab, was because uh, you're going to be using them quite extensively from now on. Because you don't want stuff running at 50 megahertz all the time, right? Um, so you can't actually synthesize this delay in uh, Verilog, the hashtag 10. That only works for your simulation. So you actually have to use the pin of clock and then use the clock divider for that. So the clock divider is built from something called an external oscillator that then has something called a phase loop, phase lock loop, some fancy circuit that essentially makes sure that it stays at, uh, your clock signal stays at 50 megahertz and is consistent. Wait, I have a funny side though about the phase lock loop. So I saw my cousin, he was like, uh, Chintia, you know, over your life, you can like have a lot of fun, you can like be a general, you can be a general engineer, or you can be a really specific and make a lot of money. And he was like, I have a friend who actually literally spends every day just researching phase lock loops. So there's a lot that you can do with them, I guess. Basically, it's just a control system that makes sure that your oscillator, like a crystal or whatever, oscillates at the correct frequency all the time. But um, supposedly, if you want to get into that, you spend your whole life on it. Alrighty. Now on to some of the other I.O. We have GPIO headers. So if anyone's worked with a Raspberry Pi, it's the exact same uh, layout. So you can actually use like Raspberry Pi hats on uh, your FPGA. Uh, these could be used for microphones, 555 timers, uh, and any other thing that you see right here. Then we have Arduino headers. So mostly everyone should have been able to be using an Arduino by now. Um, it has the exact same layout as your standard Arduino. Um, and it, you can actually also use Arduino shields on the FPGA, which becomes really valuable when you want to do some uh, uh, combination of our circuits and our FPGA. Um, so it gives us I2C support. It, uh, and also has uh, secondary purposes, such as I2C. And you can also find the exact names of the pinouts in uh, the data sheet. When you're going to look at the uh, development board, you're actually going to see a bunch of different things that don't necessarily uh, apply to this. So for example, the reset pins uh, marked 3v3. It is not the 3v3 pin. Um, a lot of us last year plugged in our power to the 3v3 pin, and it took a very long time for each one of us to figure that out. So you make sure you reference the data sheet and make sure you have everything plugged in the proper spots. It's going to be the first thing that we ask you guys when we're working on our projects. That's, okay. okay. That was a little contradictory because you said that the data sheet could be wrong and that it could be right. No, no. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the board itself. The board marked is wrong. The data sheet is right. Yeah, that's what. Sorry, maybe I didn't make that clear. All right. You want to go for the pick round? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our development kit actually has a module of RAM on it. It's not like the RAM that you'd see on your desktop. It's just like a tiny little package. Um, it's only a couple of megabytes, but it's really useful if you start running out of registers on your uh, FPGA and you want to store big files. So say you wanted to store like a music file, uh, you don't want to have everything in registers then because then it'll just like take up all your space to do actual fun processing stuff. Um, so what we do is we call our RAM module and we, you, we interface with that in order to get some of our better files, our bigger, better files. Um, yeah. In order to use RAM, we don't actually have to um, design the entire uh, system. Instead, Cordis has a um, layout already ready for you. Uh, if you go under edit, uh, insert template, and it's under system Verilog, RAMs and ROM, full designs, RAMs, ROMs, mixed with port RAM, and it's all right here. All you have to do is add that to your project, and then you just have to call this module, and you'll be done. It's a lot easier than uh, designing this entire interface, uh, and it's a lot less scary. Okay, wait, so with the RAM, when you do this, okay, when you do the project, when you do spec, what are we on, three? Speed five. Okay, checkpoint, okay, checkpoint five, spec three. You'll think it's, I mean, hopefully you think it's cool, because I, I think there's like a game at the end. Um, but, if you're like, you know, 
thinking about it, you're like, maybe I want to do that next year. There's this really cool thing that our president actually did, where if you know what a fast forward transform is, right now our fast forward transform uses 16 points, but our president, Keotero, actually made it so they can do a thousand or they can actually do any number of points that you want when you input it. So it's n point FFT, which we'll cover later. You don't have to know what FFT is now. But when you do it, you'll realize that's pretty crazy because you can, the hardware has to know like how many inputs it's taking. We can do an endpoint that's pretty wild, right? Um, as in like literally any factor of two you can down the inputs in. And the more inputs you have, the more like the better resolution. Accurate, yeah, the better resolution your your Fourier transform will have. So um, that is done. Bring it back to this. That is all done because he used a RAM instead of just registers to do his FFT. So if you want to swell, and you want to be real snazzy, you might be able to get DAB 2.0 from Caleb and uh, choose the DAB. So keep that in mind. <laughs> I heard from Caleb too that if you do DAB 2.0, you're automatically president. I'm not sure if that's true <laughs> or not, but like you might want to. You know, give it a try at least. All right, so since Andrew carried us through what's on the feature, now we're going to talk about how to get from our software to the hardware. So, Portis IDE, as I said, lets us compile our design onto hardware. So, how do we get through that? Um, first, we're going to go to the pin plan. So, I talked before about how you need to assign all the pins on your and like plug into the right places. But this is a little different. Pin planner. Um, is actually saying our FPGA has a bunch of I.O. pins, like the actual FPGA chip of the square on our development board has a bunch of pins. Um, when you pull a pin planner, it'll show you where the pins are, but that doesn't really mean anything to us. What we care about is we look at the data sheet and we check which pins can do what. So some pins are, are like meant for I.O., some are meant as like voltage or ground. Um, we connect those to, uh, we want to like connect those to maybe switches to like keep the status stuff. So maybe you know, your input A, you connect to pin, like, they're usually go like P16 or something, and then that P16 might just switch. Yeah, so you can see here, um, this is where we do pin assignments, and you'll get like, like here it says like result zero, right? So result is a variable I had in the code. Result zero is a zero bit of result, and uh, you can assign it to pin N9. And pin N9, if you look in the data sheet, will be like connect it to maybe some LED or something so you can monitor the zero bit of result. So this, right now I'm showing on a static slide, it will be a little weird. When you click through this on your actual um, cordis, you'll understand like it's pretty dope. Um, yes, so here is the data sheet. You'll see that it, it's labeled which LED. The, what LED that is will also be labeled on the data sheet, like, uh, like which one of the 10. And then you take the pin number you input it into the location um, box. That was that was an editable box called location for whichever like bits that you want to monitor. Let's say, um, and then you have to do one more thing. You can see the data sheet says the I/O standard is 3.3 volt LVTTL. So there's like 10 I/O standards or something that that PGA is capable of. Each pin has like a different um, set of I/O standards you can do. But if you want to use L that LED, you have to give it this L this IO standard because that's what the LED <coughs> needs to see. Um, and then once you set the, the location of the pin and the IO standard, then you're probably good to go because that means that you've now wired basically wired pin um, A8 on your FPGA, like the actual square, A8. to yeah that that's pin A8 on your actual square like FPGA chip. That is going to be wired to your development board's LED. Which is um, LED R zero. It's like playing Battleship. Yes, I guess if you use FPGAs for dads, it would literally be like the um, <laughs> Okay, so from there, now we done the pin planner. So that step, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but you, that's like, you compile the design first. You click compile, it does all the stuff for you. Then you pin plan because now it knows what like actual, like result zero only will show up in your pin planner if you compile, because now it knows what your outputs of your design are. Um, and at this point, we're not using a test bench. Okay? So our test bench is the FPJ basically now. So you'll have a top level entity, which has outputs and inputs, and those inputs and outputs are, where, are what you're connecting to your pins. So for example, um, for our hash thing, right? We had the clock input and a hash output. So what we're gonna do maybe 
I mean, we're not gonna do it here, but you, what you could have done is take the clock input as a 50 megahertz clock from from the from the FPGA itself. So you go in pin planner, you pick the clock, you feed that into input clock in maybe in your design, uh, and then you would take the output and you feed that to some sort of seven second display module, and that would that would give you your hash output. So that's the power of this is that we can turn go from test fetches, which are all just like static waveforms, and go onto an actual FPGA, and you'll see stuff like running in real time. Um, so compiler, really, all you need to do is click compile, and then do the post programmer, and I mean, do the pin planner, and then you can just go straight into the code, which 90% of things will break in analysis and synthesis. So do analysis and synthesis first, and that makes it so you don't have to wait all that time for it to prepare the compiler to do everything. So you know, instead of taking like three, four minutes to compile, it's going to take like ten seconds, and then or to check analysis and synthesis, and you're going to be told if it's right or wrong, right? What? What? I did not. Add a, I did not add a sound bit to this. So. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. Here. Nice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> slides. Um, that's what you call the bad for. Uh, <laughs> right. So, so once you have the compiled design, you want to put it on your board. Uh, you already have the pins planned. Then you click on programmer, which I think. Hold on one second. Programmer. Yeah. So you click on where it says programmer. You, when you look through the slides, they won't have the weird sound. Um, and then you get to this window. This window is your programmer. Um, and then for the first time you do this, Windows is a little weird. You may have to install like a driver, which is the driver that a lot of you might have not, it might have said like it just didn't install. So this is where you fix that. We put that in drive where we can inspect, but it's just like a couple steps you do. You have to like turn off like the security of your, right, you have so to like, yeah, boot just like in safe mode. Or Windows has this thing where there's called like driver certificates and so Altera doesn't have a driver certificate for their uh, USB blaster uh, driver. So what happens is that you try and download the driver and it's like, no, that's not allowed. That's going to be a virus. But we, we're going to trust Altera, at least for this. Um, so we're going to disable our uh, driver, driver certificate checking, uh, download the driver, and please, 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 for the security of your laptop, for the security of your credit card information, re-enable your driver's certificates. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's going to be really important so that you guys don't download drivers that are actually viruses. All right. If you don't see a USB blaster up there at the top, you can go ahead and click hardware setup, and then click this little drop down. If you don't see a USB blaster here, then you're probably going to have to go and check if your FPGA is plugged in. That's and great. then, uh, if not, then you might have to go check your driver and see if that's an issue. Hopefully, you have a USB port. Um, otherwise, you need a USB C to USB adapter. <laughs> For all my my Mac users out there. All right. <laughs> what we got here? So, okay. Once you do the um, compilation, actually, you don't need to. You don't need to put it on your board. You can see this. The flow summary will show up. It's like when you even when you analyze this inside, the thing that shows up. You, you'll see like a little pop-up comes up right and then and it like blocks your code. Oh, this is this is gonna be telling you like how many logic elements you used, uh, what other, maybe like maybe like did you use RAM or stuff. Um, if you enable the power analyzer actually, you can see if like how much power your design is using. It's usually like a milliwatt scale. I, I, I tried comparing my Andrew to see which one of us was low power. But since I have like an, I had this like testing file added in, uh, ours was the exact same when you take the testing file out. So I think it might be kind of like that. It's not even back to an estimator, unless you like give it a bunch of inputs. But that we're not really going to work on. That's just like if you care about being low power, here, here you go. Um, but yeah, so you can check how many logic elements it's using. If you do your DAB and you're using like 49k, just stop using registers. Like you can use some wires, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is how you can like check like how efficient you're designing stuff and if you can actually go on your. Oh yeah, this is just showing you like how to turn on the power analyzer. All righty, we're done with our lab. So we're gonna be doing, 
that we're done with our lecture. That's right, man. Uh, so we're going to be going and starting lab three immediately after this. So this is our first time we're going to be using real hardware projects. So you're at checkpoint zero. You're going to be uh, checking out your FPGA with us and uh, getting your team name on your FPGA box. Um, you're going to be learning how to use the switches, the buttons, and the LEDs for checkpoint zero through two. For checkpoint three through and four is going to be a stopwatch, which uses which culminates everything that you learned at checkpoint zero through two into one big project. It's not that big. Um, then you're going to be doing a checkpoint four is the or yeah checkpoint four is going to be your stopwatch. Checkpoint three is going to be uh, your combined seven segment, and then checkpoint five is going to be your RAM module. That's going to be probably the hardest uh, hardest lab, so please start that early. Uh, the RAM module is probably going to be the hardest checkpoint to do, so please 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 start that early, and then we're going to have checkpoint six, which is going to be a bit of fun. Um, it's going to be our FPGiano, FPGiano, yeah, buzz buzz. Uh, <laughs> it uh, at the end of that by week ten, we're hoping to have a social where we play our pianos for everyone and we see who can make up the best song on their piano. And it's much less annoying than Ops. I just like to put that out there. Ops's frequency is like insanely loud, or like just terrible. And like when you're in the lab, all the Ops people come in and just start like. Breaking your ear, but ours is and we tuned it to like a lower C, so we're chilling on the thing. Right. We and actually I play Twinkle Twinkle on it, so like it's definitely possible. Maybe one of you can like drop like mm -hmm. I don't know some beats. You know? Some of you guys <laughs> have proper music theory, so you <laughs> yeah. have to add a couple things to it. They might be able to have like a lot of fun with the piano. Um, we're gonna be sending you guys the spec with the frequencies that don't make it sound horrible, which is like within the same frequencies of middle C. Uh, so hopefully that helps out a bit. Um, we're actually spinning this uh, lab up into three sets of checkpoints. So we have 0, 1, 3, 4, and 5, and 6, or 0 through 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Each of those are due after uh, Wednesday the 17th, Monday the 22nd, and then a week later, Monday the 29th. Um, and if you haven't done, if you haven't finished lab 2, don't worry. Basically, this Wednesday is zero. Checkpoint zero includes finishing lab two. So if you had to get extension to the midterms or something, or you lose like four people's computer broke, it's fine. You can get it fixed. Hopefully by this Wednesday, um, uh, we'll be we'll make sure like the lab lecture award is gone. But like you know, at least you're moving on with the project because you kind of need to know that stuff to do this lab. Um, but yes, that will also include. We hope all of you are like know your teammates by now. I know some people's teams. Might not even be here, but um, hopefully you get to meet with them sometime. And we hope you have a group chat that like is kind of active, because really for us, like, like I'm proud of you for finishing everything you're alone. But I also don't want to check off like 50 people, 50 people alone. So <laughs> please come in with your team. Like, <laughs> plus, if you come in with your team, you guys could use your teamwork to do the checkoff questions, right? Yes, that's true. So. Three minds, much better than one mind. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> you guys can share the brain cell. All right. Um, in that case, I think I think checkpoint zero includes like also getting your kid. That will be just in the actual lab. We're not giving them to you right now. But you can come in whenever their lab hours the lab is open, pick it up, put your team name on it. Um, only one person team per team can physically have it at a time, right? Because there's only one box and there's like three or four of you. But that's fine. You don't need to all have it. You can just work out together. When once you have your design skills, you can put it on. It's Please do not lose it. It's worth like it's not probably like one hundred. It's one hundred and sixty-seven dollars before we add things to it, so it's probably closer to two hundred dollars. You guys are responsible for your kids. Do not lose it. Do not damage anything. Please, please, please. Um, you know we want to keep this going for years to come, and that includes not breaking what we have right now. Do we have any questions? That means we're either really good or really bad. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. In that case, do you have anything more? No. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it. We'll be seeing you for the next checkoffs. Next week. Yeah.